Throughout the music video era, we saw several transitions. We were growing as a culture. In 2000, it became about the Vixen. We were the aesthetic. We were part of the fabric. I'd literally walk up to you and say, hey, I make music videos and I'd like to put you in one. The next week, you'd be on some set somewhere doing something crazy. She had the curves, but she had the face. She had the attitude. Women were getting paid like rappers. Those days were cut short very quickly. And the concept of video vixen became a lot more salacious. There was girls that were willing to do a whole lot for airtime. Here's how we changed the culture. Here's how we owned ourselves, owned our bodies, did our thing, and came out of that all right. You can tell through music where we are as a people. You can tell the social climate, you know, politically, everything. You can tell through music. Hip hop was always braggadocious. It was always talking about I'm this, I'm that, but hip hoppers were, they weren't making a lot of money. But when you start getting into the 90s, the early 2000s, we really start to see money. It was rock and roll. It was rock and roll. It was all the things that you heard about from the white girls. But, you know, it's set to a different time and in a different genre. Being a vixen is a female that's in a music video that was the lead girl, the main girl. She definitely has a stage presence, an aura, that makes people want to know who she is. She had an it factor. She had something about her, not just visually pleasing, but she knew how to react to the camera. She wasn't a Vogue magazine model. She had the curves, but she had the face, and she looked like the chick that was around the way that you could get at. She got the attention and the eye of everyone, not just the artists, not just the directors, but the audience. The males want to see that. The girls wanted to be that. I remember looking at those girls and being like, oh, I just want to be in one music video. I just want to be in one video. The music video budgets back then, 400, 500. Some big, big artists were million. Music videos became a lot bigger. Uh, they became a lot more detail-oriented. They became like many movies. Well, um, the, I think the budgets are so high because uh, my competition is in the Nurban Act anymore. We can't come trying to, you know, compete with NSYNC, Britney, Christina, you know, with a $2 video. It just seemed like record companies were, like, battling to see who could have the most inflated budgets. This is when we were still selling physical music. There's money being made, money being spent. I could not do a video that wasn't in the club, that didn't have the uh, Cristal, because they were pushing that party lifestyle. They were pushing that we made it. And you always want to see a pretty chick, you know, that feels like success, you know, it feels like money. These girls at one point were making big money to star in these big budget videos, and they were stars in their own right. You know what it is, man, it's Rap City Q45. I got somebody very special stopping through the building, Gloria Velez. Women were getting paid like rappers. A lot of people didn't know how much money I was actually making. I don't like to talk like numbers, but yeah, I, I have no complaints about what I got paid. <laughs> the phone calls maybe at two o'clock in the morning for a video the next day with a major artist. The bag, like I was getting paid like $10,000 a video. These girls start to become just as popular as the artists. Melissa Ford, for some reason, people clicked. I'm like, what? Who's she? I think she was the one that just made everything look very classy, very beautiful, very effortless. You know, she was definitely not the typical stereotype of ditzy and, oh, she just wanted to be around the rappers type. Mainly I got into music videos because I was a university student and I was, you know, being offered American money, tax-free under the table, and the ability to travel and meet new people. And it, I mean, what 20-year-old girl's gonna pass that up? The first video was this video called Northern Touch. It's pretty obscure. Director X, he basically just said, you're the object of desire in this video. Maybe three days later, I get a call from Hype Williams people saying, Hype Williams wants you to be in his next video. I was like, oh my God, Hype Williams, holy shit. Fast forward to March 2000, I'm on a $10 million yacht in Trinidad doing Big Pimpin' with Jay-Z. It was pretty unbelievable to actually be a part of that. I was standing on the top level 
of this yacht with um, another girl drinking Cristal. And I looked at it, I was like, can you believe that this is our life? She was like, for three days, this girl. I was like, yes. Big Pimpin', for example, we didn't approach it like a production. We approached it like uh, an event that we were all a part of. We flew about 70, 80 people down. Uh, and just had the most fun you can have and just roll some cameras at the same time. For, for whatever reason, Big Pimpin' clicked with everybody and then we just entered the craziness. It's Big Pimpin', baby. That's right. Big Pimpin' spinning. When Gloria Velez did Big Pimpin', the way that she just rocked along with the whole look of everything. I'm big pimpin', baby, in every aspect of my life. So to have a woman like her, it was like, that's the fantasy world of every guy that wants to be a Jay-Z or a Bun B and Pimp C. She shined more in that video, I think, than some of the artists. You know what I mean? And the song was bananas, so. Big pimpin', we spendin' cheese. Check them out now. Big pimpin' on BLAD. The Big Pimpin' video, I didn't know it was gonna be that huge, honestly. The night before, we all hung out. So I was like, and I was really, really young. I wasn't even 21 yet, so I shouldn't even have been drinking. And that day I met Pimp C. We hit it off. I was listening to his music, he was listening to mine, and we were vibing. And then I went to the trailer and fell asleep. Another girl was in my position, there. He was like, no, I want Gloria here. She's not, I'm not having this girl. And he kind of like, he fought for me. That is so dope. They woke me up, I hardly, if you really look, I hardly have any makeup on. My hair was just brushed and I put, and that was my outfit. That was actually my birthday outfit. <laughs> and I just put that on and he had a fur. He was like, yeah, cause people weren't doing it in the summer, wearing a fur coat. We started that shit, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> she got notoriety and other girls got notoriety and they became uh, uh, celebrities. I got one of the stars of Jay-Z's video, Gloria Velez right here. What's up, baby? What's the deal, baby? And you can check her out. She was in a double XL. She got a double XL. She got eye candy of the year. And she's going to be in the Source 2001 calendar, right? That's right. All right, so I'm going to have her here. You can get her at home, put on your wall and everything, and do what you do. You know what I'm saying? The audience was looking to see who the new girls were. And everyone wanted to know what their names were. So magazines like Vibe and Double XL and some of the, the other urban or hip-hop magazines started featuring the girls. Before social media and how email took off, everyone used to write in to say what they felt or how they felt about a particular issue. Yo, who's that girl in um, Ludacris video? I was like, what? <laughs> like, damn, why they ask about her? And then boom, another letter. I'll open up another one. Yo, who's that girl in Q-Tip video? Who is this girl in such and such video? I'm like, uh, we started King Magazine uh, November of 2001, and straight out the gate, our very first issue, we had Lila Arcieri, you know, who we knew most from Q-Tips Vibrant Thing video. So we knew earlier on that these girls were stars. You know, they weren't just an accessory. They were something that, you know, we had to deal with, and um, we were really excited to be able to introduce a platform that allowed them to consistently shine. Features became covers, multiple covers, calendars. And so I was a lot more like Pamela Anderson back then, just in terms of like, you know, the merchandising of my image and it just being kind of everywhere. So I became like the, the blueprint, the foundation of video modeling, so to speak. I wasn't trying to do that, it just happened. As much as people want to get at, you know, all the different magazines that covered these women back then, if not for those magazines, they would not have a voice. If you can go anywhere in the country and look at any newsstand in the country, you see a Gloria who's in Jay-Z's video next to Jay-Z on the cover. Ooh, now we talking like, let's bring this status up. It was just, we brought something different, you know? And so they see you everywhere and they wanna know more about you. They wanna touch you, they wanna be, be there. I think they represented for some women that were never even seen before, you know, in mainstream. Here are some of the most beautiful women of color that you'll ever see. We used to get a lot of flack when we started King Magazine because we always had beautiful women of color on the cover. Yeah, bathing suits, bikinis, and it's like, oh, you guys are objectifying women. No, these are beautiful women. It's like, this is like a love letter, a tribute. You know, bringing that conversation from the barbershops in the hoods of America, especially in black neighborhoods, to the pages. And it was like, it was like a dream come true. Vixens and models gave the 
young black girl an alternative view of beauty. You know, like, I'm not going to ever look like this chick on Cosmo. But I can look like this chick on Black Men's Magazine or on Smooth Magazine, which wasn't much different, like their attire or anything else. They glorified our natural bodies. You know, it wasn't just one shape. They glorified all cultures of women. These video vixens will never get credit for making some little brown or black girl feel as if she's beautiful. They'll never get credit for making not only black and brown girls feel as if they're beautiful, but also influencing girls in white culture to say, hey, I want to look like that too. Until hip hop came along, beauty was still skinny girls, maybe some boobs was, oh my goodness, she's voluptuous, right? And then suddenly the world got to see what ass is all about. Like why did Kim Kardashian say, you know what? This booty thing works. The music industry took a hit that no one was prepared for. Piracy causes huge losses for the U.S. economy. The music industry no longer controls the distribution of its own product. There are no more record stores. We have to use all the resolve and imagination we can summon to baffle this piracy. If a contractor builds a building, should people be allowed to move into it for free? No, no one bought CDs out of the goodness of their heart. They bought CDs because that's how they got the music. And when the platform changed, so did the people. Labels started firing people. The A&R department all but disappeared altogether. Well, as a video director, I started to see the budget change. And I remember speaking to Harv from Bad Boy, and he's saying, yo, Teeth, it's the last one. We're not doing these budgets like this. And I was like, why? <laughs> Life is good. And he was just like, yo, the record sales. I mean, you have to change the business model. You can't have all this excess and not have it coming back in. X, we gotta do it again now. Yeah, do it again, man. We were brethren. Yeah, man. We would do it again, man. Sing, sing, Big sing. things are gone. That is. Yeah. An artist who they didn't have as much money to spend, but you had to make your music video. You had to do all the same things. You just weren't making as much money. You know, just the popularity of music had shifted away from Northeast Coast, you know, Brooklyn, Bronx, New York running things to more Southern rap and stripper culture. And a lot of those rap songs have a sexiness to them that instantly take you to like a strip club, instantly take you to the beach or places where you see women like that. When Buffy busts on the scene in 2005, it was the same thing. It's like she's dark skin, she's from the South, she's a stripper, she's admittedly a stripper, and the strip club culture was just exploding. You know, she came out with the big butt. She started that, you know, with the big booty and embracing her thickness, because she was thick, thick, <laughs> you know? Buffy was one of the rare, rare ones. Super dark chocolate, you know, built like a brick house, had that southern movement with her, real sweet smile, and um, dudes just fell in love with her. Hey! It's Rap City right now, and today we're doing Who's That Girl? Actually, I never really tried to be a video model. Um, it happened, and I tell people this all the time, it happened by mistake. I took some photos, the photographer put the photos online without my permission. So, of course I was upset, but then, you know, that was back around the time when message boards was really popular. So I started a Yahoo group, and from that group is when I was contacted by G-Unit. Um, they contacted me through my Yahoo group. Mm. And really, I didn't even believe that it was really them actually contacting me. So I was like, yeah, right. So they contacted me like four or five times before I actually emailed them back. So uh -huh. they sent the number, and I blocked my number and called <laughs> them because I wasn't for sure. Next thing you know, I was on the phone with um, Tony Yayo and 50 Cent. I was like, is this really happening? <laughs> when she did So Seductive, it was really interesting because we was trying to keep Yale focused. It was amazed. Everyone was amazed by her body. That first video I was in, I think they paid me like $2,500 to be there, the main girl. Before the whole thing was over, girls was getting $300. They had to pay for their own flight. You had to get your own hotel. Things changed drastically by the time I got out the industry. I was hearing all types, so I'm like, are you serious? 
It changed so much where I was like, I, I actually felt sorry for some of those girls. People in the hood, girls in the hood, like, yo, I'm trying to get that money. You know, I want to do that. I'm pretty. People think I'm cute. And so the other girls in the club are seeing that, and they want that as well. They want that lifestyle as well. What video directors and casting directors realized was they could get girls that looked physically just like me from the strip club who were very, very, very comfortable being naked in front of cameras and pay them a whole lot less. And so it, it just became a whole evolution that brought it to where we are now. Casting calls, I hated them with a passion. If something was very wrong about having a casting call and you coming in with little nothing on and then we tell you, all right, let me see you dance. All right, now turn around, let me see your butt. <laughs> all right, now let me see you drop it, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, I can't believe we doing this. And they're doing it, you know, they came there for that. All people wanted to see at that time was nakedness. Hot women, glistening in oil. If you didn't have that in your video, no one was watching. I believe that was the era of the BET Uncut. BET Uncut used to keep a lot of us up super late at night. I'm gonna just tell you, man, it was, it was a real thing. And um, yes, it was a cultural indicator of how far you can go. See, now I can't blame it all on Uncut. But if you open a medium to say, show us your rawest. Well, somebody's always going to get raw <laughs> and raw and raw. And so uh, it opens the door for access to people that would normally not get access to doing these type of videos. I said it must be your ass because it ain't your face. I need a tip trail. I need a tip trail. I said it must be your ass because it ain't your face. I need a tip trail. I mean, look at Tip Drill. Who directed Tip Drill? Benny Boone directed Tip Drill, but that's not the name he used as his director's credit. A lot of mainstream directors didn't want to get in that way. They didn't want their name on it, but you know, we were shooting them. So the shift was changing because you could get racier and you're not gonna see Melissa Ford get butt naked and somebody swipe a car through her butt. It wasn't happening. It was a lot. You remember, they were having full-on debates on BET, like full shows about what's going on with all these girls and music videos. I'm Jeff Johnson, and we're talking about women and hip-hop. How can you maintain integrity when money, in many cases, is the issue? I can't answer that question, but I would like to ask Nelly. When you do a, a, a video like Tip Drill, do you think about yourself as someone who's setting a price on the black female body? When Tip Drill came out, Nelly's video and the Spellman women spoke out against it and boycotted that video because of the, you know, credit card swipe through the butt cheeks. Um, that really changed things as well because artists were not ready for that pressure. Now, I agree. When we did tip drill and I wanted to address to the ladies to Spellman, I got a backlash and I was going to get protested. You feel what I'm saying? And I felt that was unfair, and I am a little bitter on this subject because I did an adult video that was for adults, and instead of you pulling a brother to the side, you want to protest my stance, but you have yet to protest, you have yet to pick it in front of any of them strip clubs that are no more blocked than a 10-block radius from your school. Don't because blame you know us for selling is? it, blame them for buying Because you know what hip-hop is? Hip-hop is a mirror. All hip-hop is is a mirror, and it's staring at America right back in his face. Yeah. And that's what you're getting right now. It's a big mirror, and this is what you created. Can and America is looking in this mirror, and sometimes they don't like what they see, well, but it's what you created. The viewing audience, especially women, started to feel like, you know, I'm not really you know, standing behind this. This isn't very empowering. There wasn't a really high level of respect, I feel, for women during that time. I think in hip hop and in music in general, especially the urban market, they never really talk highly of women, ever. Country music is lovey-dovey and they praise their women. Latin music, salsa merengue, and they praise their women, they, it's beauty. But in hip hop, not so much. So we're, we're kind of, we, we kind of get used to it. We bop our heads and we rap along, even though if they're dissing us, calling us hoes or whatever, because it's what we grew up on, you know? And it just got worse. So people started to wonder, as a music video model or vixen, 
why would you participate in a project that, be, that calls you all kinds of, you know, bees and hoes and this, that, the other? After strip club culture was introduced into videos, once porn culture was introduced into uh, to music videos, for a lot of these girls who were just even in it just to make an honest living, a lot of their value went down in terms of where we saw them, uh, you know, just in the, the public court of opinions. I had it rough as far as like blog sites, internet, and things like that. They definitely were, the comments were bad. They were horrible, they was at my neck for sure. Naturally, that just shit rolled downhill, you know? Like everything just became sporadic and the girls in retrospect had to figure out like what's our next thing. I stopped doing videos. I was already on to the next. Because you can do videos for so long. That's like a stepping stone. A video career vixen, it's not longevity. You know, I knew that there was an exit ramp that I was going to take eventually. I knew it wasn't going to last long. So I'm like, what am I going to be doing when, it, when it's all said and done? Yeah, things got really dark when the money changed. Um, but luckily for me, I had an anecdote for that. I started writing books. <laughs> Where young girls once aspired to be models and ballerinas, they now aspire to be hip hop video girls, the next hot girl in the hottest artist video. Having lived that life, I can say it's not everything it's cracked up to be. Okay, so the book. <laughs> that book. Duh. Isn't everybody else gonna answer this? <laughs> it's like, oh. yo. Good book. This, this classic, legendary read. There was already this, you know, kind of backlash towards video modeling, video vixens, just music in general for, you know, being misogynistic and whatnot, and then this book drops, Confessions of a Video Vixen. I was like, are you effing kidding me? I met Corinne Steffens at Keith Paschel's house, and she told me about the book that she was writing. We were sitting at the table talking and I expressed to her like probably millions of other people in the industry, like why would you tell this story? Kiss and tell, like that's your business model? Uh, obviously a lot of rappers were very uh, frustrated that a lot of this information was getting out there. Corinne tells all in her 2005 book, Confessions of a Video Vixen and calls out the hip hop industry for treating women as disposable sex objects. I'm very excited about this book. I'm excited about the way that it turned out. It's my story, you know, and it's not someone else's story or what I heard about something. It was just, it's me and my story. And I know that it's the story of other people. And I'm excited to hear um, what the world has to say. You tell your story, but you also tell their story and take away their privacy by naming them for profit. There's something very uh, wrong, something very unfair about that. I just think the book put us in a bad light. I feel like, you know, they focused on her and made all of us seem like we're like her. We all sleep around, you know, we all want these artists. And that's not the case. I underestimated how much urban culture and that music hates its women, especially the women who talk. A woman is judged by the man she's with a lot more times than how many men she's with. Because if I had sex with 20 regular nobodies and school teachers and firemen that you don't care, you wouldn't care. There's always gonna be hoes everywhere. In every workplace, you got a hoe. I mean, that's fact. <laughs> There's a hoe in, in you know, if you work at a hospital, if you, you work at a nail shop, you know, you know your hoes. And she was just one of them. I did videos for a year, actually less than a year. That's it. It was less than a year. But I'm the most memorable video girl there ever was. To be real with you, I had never heard of her before until that book came out. I had never seen her in any magazines. I had never um, seen her in any videos. So honestly, I didn't know where she had came from all of a sudden. I thought that she was an urban myth. When I'm reading this book and I'm hearing about all her experiences, I was literally like, where the f was she? Where was she? Like, I never saw her. 
I didn't know what she looked like until I saw the cover of that book. I was like, are you kidding me? And the experiences that she outlined, those were her choices. She chose to be paid to be in the trailer with whoever and in the car with whoever doing whatever it was that she was doing with them. That's not my story. As a matter of fact, I was the queen of no. No, I'm not wearing that. No, I'm not doing that. Can I kiss you? No, don't touch me. I have a man to go home to. I don't think she was, people wanted to see her or know her name when she was in the videos. I don't think she had that it factor. She got that when she talked about famous people. You know what I'm saying? That's what made her famous, not the videos. She was on Oprah. I'm watching Oprah like, this chick is on Oprah. This is the girl that was in Keith's kitchen telling me she's writing this book, and now she's sitting on Oprah looking like a Mormon and talking about her experience in music videos. For you to try to ruin other people's lives and families, you knew these men were married, you knew what was, what you played, you knew what part you're supposed to play and put that out there. I can't respect that. I just can't respect her. Corinne Moore was like the diary of a groupie, more so than a video vixen, you know what I mean? Because she was basically taking money for sex and they were like paying for her bills and all of these other things. The perception of that book, it, it wasn't ingested correctly into people's minds, you know? Because that's just one person's story. So at the end of the day, you can't classify a whole genre or a whole class of women or a whole profession of women based on Corinne's whole hoish ho 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 ways, you know? It was a shock to everyone. It was before social media. Like yeah. Twitter wasn't a thing. You know, Facebook was kind of a thing a little bit. Right. You know, we didn't have Instagram. Those things didn't exist. Right. And I let you, I was the first social media. Like I let you see things that you'd never seen before. It is a misogynistic industry. I don't think thinking like a man is good enough. I think thinking like a misogynist is best. When the book came out, it, it put a stamp on all of us. That book put a black stain on the culture. It put a black stain on the models because you'll never be a vixen, you'll be a hoe. And that's what that book did. Whether or not you were in a trailer, you know, performing fellatio, fellatio or you were in a corner reading a book, catching up on your studies, we were all lumped into the same category. And it was incredibly frustrating to be defined by somebody else's actions. Here's the thing, if I was ever concerned about the reactions of others, I wouldn't be here. I might still be a stripper if I was concerned about the world's reactions to what I think and what I write and what I feel. Talking about the, the elements of hip hop from, from b-boying to DJing, these things rose from the ashes like a phoenix in this music and this culture and created money and, and a lifestyle for people that were in the hood and that came up by their bootstraps because of their talent. Hip hop has done so much uh, that you would pimp it out like that. You, the whole thing was for, for money. I'm sure she would say that too. That her, her whole aspiration behind that was, F you, I'm gonna get paid. We saw an opportunity to grab headlines, to sell millions of books, to end up on Oprah, to do the whole thing. That, my dear, is good business. But here's the thing. When men do it, it's expected. When a woman does it, it's a problem. Within hip hop, within the industry, I think uh, she was criticized and, and sort of frowned upon and people didn't want their business out in the streets. But when I think about that, I think of, well, if you could rap about her in a record or rap about another woman in a record, then she had the right to tell her story in a book. Women, especially women of color, defend their men, even and especially when their men are dead ass wrong. They support and defend rapists, child abusers, drug addicts, alcoholics, criminals. They will stick up for these men because God forbid they rally against and make better their own men. Now, you fast forward 12 years, and there is a new movement of feminism. There is a new movement of just awareness amongst women, especially women in urban culture. And women are not defending men as much as they were in their filth. Corinne definitely was a disruptor, you know? And if we talk about modern times and what that means for women, the way that the disruption is happening, you know, these days, whole industries are, are, are pretty much crumbling. 
and what Corinne did in, in hip hop, she was exposing um, those same type of antics 10, 12, 13 years ago. And for her to expose those things, I think it kind of curtailed a lot of the abuses that happened. So no matter how mad people would get at her, um, her doing that probably saved probably a couple of other women. If that book would have come out now, it might have not gone that way. It's her body, it's her choice, right? That's the era we're in now. That's what we're recognizing. We're, we're at the beginning of the new age. We're, we're now entering a whole other perception of female sexuality and that that narrative is no longer shaped by men. I think it's important to leave proof of life, you know, and to discuss all parts of your life and not be ashamed of any of it, especially for the women, because so much of our history is erased by patriarchy, by um, standards and, and all those things. It's so important for us to stand up and say, this is what we did. This is why we did it. Maybe this is why we would never do it again. But here are the lessons. Here's what we took from it. Here's how we changed the culture. Here's how we changed society. You know, here's how we owned ourselves, owned our bodies, did our thing, and came out of that all right. I can respect that she took everything that she went through and just made it a business and capitalized off of it. I think my emotions were um, tied into a lot of it initially because I was in those places and I was around a lot of vixens that were fighting for something different and were trying to break through the whole negative thing behind it, you know? You know, these beautiful women, unfortunately, weren't given their props as much as they should have. The story should be told. It should be honored. These women were so important for hip hop. Absolutely, the video vixen concept, the idea of these girls, they are very, very much a huge part of the culture. Uh, the huge part of, you know, why hip hop has evolved to being what it is. To be a part of hip hop history, it feels great, you know. To be a part of any type of history is, is an amazing feeling to be put in that category. You know, the silent movie stars that we were, we play an iconic role and it couldn't have been done without us. So I think, yeah, we, we deserve our props. <laughs>